Welcome everyone to episode 32 of the Sloth Investor Podcast. Once again, I'm joined by my fellow co-host Jay and our very special guest today, personal finance author J.L. Collins. J.L. is uh, the author of several investing books, most known to be The Simple Path to Wealth and more recently Pathfinders, which I've just finished reading for the past few weeks. It's a fantastic read. J.L., how are you? I'm doing well, thank you, and I'm uh, honored to be here. Thanks for inviting me. It's a pleasure. And uh, Jay, it's our, I think it's our second Christmas podcast. Uh, so how are you feeling? You know, our famous, uh, uh, our last one was, uh, I think our last Christmas podcast was with Andrew Hellum. So we're, how lucky are we to have a, another distinguished guest uh, as we lead into Christmas holiday? Absolutely. Well, now, absolutely. now I'm doubly honored that I'm I'm uh, your Christmas podcast. I, in fact, I'm, I could see my our our tree over my shoulder here, so I came Is well. That a palm tree though, in behind your Christmas tree. I, sorry. Is that a palm tree in behind your Christmas tree? <laughs> that is, yeah. The palm tree is on the outside. We're we're wintering in Florida, so uh, yeah, we have a, a Christmas tree inside and and uh, with lights, and that's thanks to my. My daughter, who's spending December with us, says she insisted we get a Christmas tree. And then, yeah, there are palm trees outside. <laughs> well, that's not too dissimilar to Hong us here in Hong Kong. We uh, we have yeah. palm trees outside, and uh, uh, it's some warm weather outside. But we try to, I think, Roy's family, my family, quite similar. We have Christmas trees inside the house as well to try and recognize the uh, traditions from home. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Absolutely. I'm still adjusting to it. I grew up in a colder climate where where Christmas was winter time. I grew up near Toronto, so that was uh, definitely snow every uh, every Christmas. Even, mm. even more so, yeah. <laughs> so, JL, um, I first stumbled upon you, I think it was around about five or six years ago, and it was via The Simple Path to Wealth, okay? And I think our audience would love to know more about the origin of that book, okay? The Simple Path to Wealth. So can you perhaps, like dive into for us like the origin of the simple path to wealth how that came about i'll be happy to do that but can yeah. i ask you a question first yeah 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 you you just mentioned that you just finished pathfinders mm. and so if we're introducing this whole concept of of following a path to financial independence which of the two books would you recommend first mm, that's a great question um i actually would Mm. it's almost as if like pathfinders gives you that kind of validation that the simple path to wealth is the correct path okay so i like the the numerous i i think perhaps pathfinders might be an easier first read um just because of kind of how accessible it is in terms of you've literally interviewed so many investors so many you know everyday investors from around the world um so i'm maybe inclined to go for pathfinders in that respect but um I do love the simple path to wealth as well because it, I found it accessible. But I think Pathfinder is because I, I just love the fact that you give that validation. You give so many stories of how other people around the world have, have you know, leaned upon simplicity as the approach to investing. So if I had to toss a coin, if I had to take one, I would probably opt for Pathfinders to begin with. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I would agree with that. And it's it's yeah. interesting to me, and I will answer your question in a moment, but yeah. it's interesting to me because when Pathfinders first came out, one of the questions was, do you have to have read Simple Path to Wealth first to enjoy or benefit from Pathfinders? And I, my answer to that was pretty easy. I said, well, no, I, you know, you could easily read Pathfinders first and then Simple Path to Wealth later. Certainly, if you've read Simple Path, then Pathfinders, you'll find Pathfinders intriguing. But the more I thought about it, the more I came to the same conclusion that you just described. And so I'm kind of curious if I'm alone in the wilderness on that. But to answer your question, um, the simple path to wealth uh, grew out of my blog. And uh, the blog, uh, which I started in, in 2011, grew out of a series of letters I was writing to my daughter about this financial stuff because I'd managed to turn her off to all things financial by pushing it too hard too soon when she was too young. And I wanted to make sure that if, if and when the time came, she was ready to hear it, it would be there even if not to be morbid, I wasn't. And then as, as the blog grew and the content on the blog grew, I, I realized I had the makings of a book. 
and I could take this simple path that I I'd formulated and in book form make it uh, better organized and more concise and and then there'd be two formats I could hand my daughter one would would be the the book and the other is is the blog and uh, uh, so that's the origin of the simple path to wealth which came out in 2016 so I started working on it in 2013 took me three years to start working on it in 2013 and then finally published in in 2016. Yeah fantastic I mean what a gift to bestow upon your daughter I mean just I mean, I, I love one of my favorite chapters in Pathfinders is family. I think it comes towards the end of the book. And again, just so important. I know Jay would echo this as well in terms of what he's been doing. He's uh, two teenage kids, but just to kind of like pass on the invest in knowledge to announce that you're acquiring, pass on those, those simple principles is so critically key. So uh, I just love the whole story behind the genesis of the Simple Path to Wealth. I think it's really great. Yeah, it really is. Yeah. Um, and in terms of Pathfinders, there was a quote that really stood out to me that I absolutely loved. Okay. And uh, you refer to index funds as the single greatest gift to the mm. individual investor in history. So, JL, could you explain to our audience why you hold that particular view? Yeah. So, to do that, we have to look at what the investment world looked like before index funds. So, Jack Bogle is the guy who, who created the idea of index funds and, and launched the very first one. This would have been in 1975. That's the same year that, that he launched the Vanguard Group, the investment group Vanguard. And the very first index fund that he created tracked the S&P 500, which is the 500 largest uh, companies in the United States. Before that, and, and his one of the keys to his brilliance with this insight is he'd done the research and he found that active management, which is to say trying to select stocks that will outperform the market overall, turns out to be appallingly difficult. And if you just buy all of the stocks in the market, the S&P 500 or uh, these days, I, I like a fund that that is the total stock market uh, index fund, which is owns virtually every uh, company in the U.S. Uh, stock market. If you own them all, you will actually outperform the vast, vast majority of people that are actively trying to outperform the market. And in fact, the longer you go out, the fewer active managers there are that can outperform. So suddenly you have this this investment strategy that gives you top performance with a fraction of the effort. And because it takes a fraction of the effort, it takes a fraction of the money to run an index fund because you don't have to hire all those expensive analysts and, and money managers. And so the cost of an index fund becomes dirt cheap, rock bottom. And one of the things that Bogle is famous for saying is that that uh, performance comes and goes, but costs are forever. So before index funds, the barrier to entry in owning shares was high and expensive. You know, if you were buying individual shares, you were paying a commission of four or five, six maybe percent buying and selling. That's, you know, you're talking about eight to 12% in and out of a stock. It's almost impossible to make money uh, over time with that kind of barrier. If you were going into a mutual fund, which in those days was by definition an actively managed mutual fund, because there was no competition from index funds, the the expense ratio, which is the annual amount that, that you pay, could be two, three, four percent of, of your portfolio. Uh, that's an incredible drag on your on your performance over time. And suddenly index funds come along and, and VTSAX, which is Vanguard's total stock market index fund, which is the one I happen to use. Well, the expense ratio on that is now 0.04%. Wow. It's incredibly inexpensive. So that's, that's the brilliance of in, index funds. They're far cheaper and they're more powerful. Yeah. And they're easier. They're simpler. Yeah. 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 Re wait, wait sticks with me is you know you talked about how you know you started off it seems like by doing blogs and then those blogs eventually culminated right. into a book 
And I think that's, that that journey is not too dissimilar to uh, Mr. Sloth. I know he's he's in the process of finalizing uh, his book to be published before too long. Can you talk? Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about sort of the catalyst for Pathfinders and what what caused you to structure the book in the way that you ended up doing it? And I wonder if there's any parallels with the your journey as well, Mr. Sloth. Mm. Yeah. So. Um... As I mentioned a moment ago, I, I started the blog to archive this information for my daughter. And I wrote the book, The Simple Path to Wealth, uh, for my daughter. And my daughter's an American, and she, at the time, was in college. Uh, you know, she's now a, a young adult. I, she's 31 and well on the path, by the way. But, you know, I had a very specific focus for what I was writing which is to say somebody at the beginning of their journey and a, a, an American. And to my amazement, almost as soon as the book came out, I started hearing stories from people who would reach out to me telling me how they'd adopted the principles in the simple path to wealth to their unique situation. Might be that they're not at the beginning of their journey, that they were you know, in their late 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s, even 60s, and they'd done many things before they came across the simple path to wealth, and they had to make those adjustments, including getting out of debt, as an example. And I started hearing these stories from people all over the world who were responding and finding value in what candidly is a pretty U.S.-centric book. I mean, I'm talking to you guys in Hong Kong now. It's kind of incredible to me. And those stories... Yeah, you know, I, every time I heard one, it made my day, but it was endlessly fascinating to me. And so this is Pathfinders is a book I wanted to do probably within six months of The Simple Path to Wealth coming out. I'd, I'd heard this enough that I thought, I want to share these these stories. And, and um, about two years ago, uh, I engaged with uh, Harriman House, a, a British publisher, and we've refined the concept and uh you know it took two years to to come up with pathfinders but you know here it is as of uh halloween this year october 31st so a little better than about well i guess about six weeks now i uh, you know and i i've referenced this before it's uh you know you and i, I think we're very very much cut from the same cloth in the way that i'm trying to talk to my own children to avoid the same mistakes that i made Right. Uh, it was Bruce Lee, I think, uh, that said, don't give your children everything that you never had. Teach them the things you never learned. And to me, that's really what, what resonates with my for me and the, what I'm working with when I'm working with my own children in terms of managing their own money. Uh, have, sorry. Oh, I was going to say that's a great quote I hadn't heard. Uh, in Pathfinder, he referenced FU money. Now, mm. of course, that's catches the uh, the attention of anybody who's listening. Can you talk a little bit more about what you mean by F you money? <laughs> well, <laughs> I, 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 I think, first of all, I probably don't have to explain what the F stands for. Uh, everybody immediately assumes it stands for forget. So forget you money. <laughs> uh, and of course, right. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but it's nice shorthand to call it F you money. It's, I wish I could claim credit for coining the term. I can't. And in fact, I've been unable to figure out what the origin is. I first came across it uh, back in the 70s, actually, uh, in a novel by James Clavell called Noble House, a great author, by the way. And in this novel, Noble House, there's a character and her ambition is to have a few money. And that means being able, of course, to say, forget you to anybody that needs to have that said to them. Uh, and in the book, it's FU money is the equivalent of being financially independent. It's enough money that you don't have to work for money. But that's financial independence to me. FU money in my world is is that intermediate phase between when you are fully financially independent and when you are building your wealth. And the moment you start building your wealth, you're becoming a little bit stronger uh, financially, and that allows you to be a little bolder in the world, to make bolder to choices and decisions, and that expands the kind of life you can lead. 
So, uh, you know, I think having FU money in that sense starts far before you achieve full financial independence. And it's important to me to think about it that way, because if you're starting from scratch uh, or even in debt and you're looking out to this fairly large number of, of investable assets you'd need to be fully financially independent, it can be pretty daunting, daunting enough maybe that it's discouraging. But if you realize that it's not an on-off switch, it's a journey. And the moment you start taking the very first steps in that journey, it's like exercising, right? The moment you start exercising, you get a little bit stronger every day. Uh, now, you're not going to be bench pressing 300 pounds, you know, on day two, but you're going to be stronger than you were the day before. It's the same thing financially. So that's that's what FU money means to me at this point. Mm. Love that, love that. I mean, you mentioned the fact that, um, you know, Jay and I, we're based in Hong Kong. And one thing that I, I can't give up is my British newspaper. So I've got two subscriptions, online subscriptions for British newspapers. And when I head to UK next week, no doubt I'll be buying some papers on a daily basis. I love just laying sloth-like on a bed, just reading the papers on a daily basis. But there's um there's an article I read uh, online, one of my newspaper apps, British newspaper apps last week. And they talk about, you know, success and happiness and what it is that generally brings people success and happiness. And as soon as I read the article, I, I, I thought about you and our upcoming interview because they mentioned freedom, you know, the ability to do what you want, when you want, you know, if you have enough money to kind of, you know, pursue freedom, whenever, if it's in your 40s, late 50s, early 60s, and I just, ah, resonated with me so deeply, particularly having read The Simple Path to Wealth and Pathfinders, and I knew that the, you know, this interview was coming up, and I just thought, ah, there you go, and I think it's just such an important lesson to instill, you know, in younger people, people of all generations, but uh, yeah, I think it's an Ipsos poll, it's an Ipsos report, and it was a published a week ago but yeah just really really resonated with me really did yeah yeah no i it's it's true i mean that's it's a matter of having some people when they come across this they think oh that just sounds like deprivation because mm -hmm. i can't spend every every dime i have on on you know consumer goods mm. uh, to me it's the very opposite of deprivation i i, I tell people i've spent every dime that i've ever gotten and I've spent them almost the moment I got them. The only difference is that I, well, actually there's no difference. I spent them like I suppose most people do on the thing that was most valuable to me. Mm. Difference is what was most valuable to me was my freedom. Yeah. And of course you buy your freedom by buying financial assets. So it never felt like deprivation to me. And by virtue of, of buying those financial assets, and buying my freedom, my, you know, my access to the world and the things I've been able to do in it vastly increased. And it made for, for a, a, a you know, a much, a much better life and certainly not one of deprivation. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now, Joe, in terms of the, I think actually the final page, the final page of Pathfinders, you referenced a gentleman from Ukraine and a gentleman mm -hmm. from Russia, quite poignantly, when I read that, I reread it again this morning, it was actually quite poignant to, to reread that. Um, but they both mentioned the phrase staying the course. You know, they both mentioned staying the course. So could you perhaps expand on for our audience what, what you mean by that term, staying the course? Yeah, so first of all, those two stories in Pathfinders, I mean, Pathfinders is filled with remarkable stories. Mm. And the fact that... that uh, I received a story from a guy who is following the simple path to wealth also has a podcast that I've been on, by the way. So he's, I mean, he has a podcast in Ukraine for people following the simple path to wealth for, for pursuing their, their financial independence. And his country has been invaded His war His you know, his assets his his domestic assets have been frozen. And then there's also a story from a guy in the middle of Russia, the country that's the invader that's that's been sanctioned by virtually every other country in the world. And, and with the economic uh, difficulties that comes in, he's uh, finding a way to fi follow the simple path. So it's, it's just the range of stories are incredible. And those two fall into the section of the book called Staying the Course. So there are nine sections in the book and Staying the Course is one of them because you know, staying the course when your country is being invaded is tough. Staying the course when your country's 
a pariah uh, in the world and ostracized. It's tough. Mm. Uh, um, and of course, there are other stories in that in that section. But staying the course means that you know it's a journey, it's a path, and as you walk along the path, there's, there are going to be distractions, and you might be pulled away from it by a war, for instance. You might be tempted away from it by some fancy thing that you decide you need to have or whatever but it's important to to bring yourself back on the path and continue on the journey the other meaning it has is that when it comes to investing you have to understand that the stock market and the stock market is our wealth building tool on the simple path to wealth is very powerful and it will make you wealthy over time but it's volatile and you have to be willing to stay the course when the market drops, when it plunges. You have to be willing to understand that market corrections, which are a 10% drop, bear markets, which are 20% drop, or crashes, which are you know, 20, 30, 40, 50%. These are perfectly normal parts of the process. You can't time them, but you can endure them. And you can take advantage of them. So it's it's like you know typhoons in Hong Kong, or blizzards in in New England. I mean, they're dangerous and they're scary. And if you panic and run out in the middle of them, you can die. But they don't last forever, and eventually they blow over and go away, and the sun comes out again. It's the same thing with market drops. And of course, when the market drops people around you will be panicking. The media will be filled with panic and people screaming, sell, sell, sell. Worst thing you can do. And that's tying yourself to the mass to make sure you're not seduced onto those rocks of panic. And if you're going to be, by the way, if you don't think that you have the mental toughness to ride out these financial storms, then you don't want to follow my advice. Because if you panic and sell, my advice will leave you bleeding by the side of the road. If, on the other hand, you recognize that when these things happen, it means stocks have gone on sale. And not only should you not panic and sell, but assuming you've set up a regular investment program where you're automatically investing part of your income, you're getting more shares for your money every time you're making that. So if anything all the more reason to keep investing through the downturns because you're buying this stuff on sale. In fact, it probably makes sense to cut other expenses during these downturns to free up still more capital to take advantage of, of what's a financial gift if you think about it in the right way. Absolutely. And Jay, I, I referenced um, a British newspaper recently. And what, just like, I don't know, perhaps it's a quirky thing about me. I don't know if I was like to do it, but I often like to kind of read articles or maybe interviews where authors kind of list their favorite books or the books they're currently reading. And it was interesting because I read a blog article of yours from a while ago now. I think it was, again, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's something like 32, 32 factors or 32 things linked to the simple path to wealth. And you referenced two books, actually, ironically, actually, also in my bookshelf. You mentioned, uh, in terms of staying, of course, you mentioned uh, Factfulness, and you also mentioned um, The Rational Optimist by Matt Ridley. Yes. Oh, wow. I'm yeah. glad you followed the advice. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, I've had those on my bookshelf for a while, but I, just when I read the article just a few weeks ago, I thought, wow, you know, so you and I definitely, I think, are aligned in terms of that, in terms of just recognizing that, yes, you know, on a yearly basis, there is going to be geopolitical upheaval, there's going to be pandemics, there may be wars in certain regions of the world, but, you know, stay the course. And for me, that's why, you know, my fifth bedrock principle of being headstrong is so critically important because, you know, very often uh, an investor's worst enemy is what, what they look at when they look in the mirror, it, you know, it's themselves. So I just love within the article how you reference kind of, yes, you know, the news tends to kind of sometimes paint a bleak picture of the world and geopolitical events and so on. But generally over time, you know, whether it's, you know, the work of Matt Ridley, Hans Rosling, Stephen Pinker, the world has gradually improved year after, after year after year. So I think that's such a prerequisite for self successful investing is that positivity and optimism for the future, no matter how bad you know things may seem to be at any particular juncture in history. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the excuse me, I just got a, a frog in my throat here. <laughs> the, so hopefully you can edit that part out. Um, <laughs> but the the media has become relentlessly negative. And 
the irony to me is the world has never been in a better situation, but it's probably also we've never been more closely linked and, and we've never had more access to information of everything that's going on at any given moment, any place in the world. And of course, because the media gravitates towards the negative things, because that draws more eyeballs, right? Mm. It, it's a picture of a, of a very dangerous, negative, poverty-stricken world. And nothing could be further from the truth. Factfulness for, for, is a wonderful title for that book yeah. because yeah. he goes through and, and shows what the actual facts are in terms of the condition you know, poverty is is dramatically down worldwide. I mean, it, it's genuinely incredible how it's improved in just my lifetime. Mm -hmm. uh, war, which I mean, you, we hear all about war every day, at least in the United States, you know, and war in Ukraine, war in Gaza, you know. But the truth is that in spite of those horrible things going on, and war has clearly not been exterminated, but there are far fewer people dying in wars than ever before. So, you know, there are far, people are living longer. They are far healthier all around the world. People are far wealthier. It's striking to me when I first started traveling internationally in the seventies, you know, places, and this was kind of a good thing. I'm glad I got to travel at the time, but I remember going to the Parthenon in Greece and there were maybe 20 people there when I went. Wow. And you could go walk anywhere. And now there are long lines to get there. Well, the only people who are traveling in those days were, frankly, Americans. Now the world has gotten far wealthier. And people from all over the world are want to get out and see it and see all these things. And, and you can see that when you travel it, how, how many more people there are who can afford to do that kind of thing. So there is, the world's never been better than it is right now. And a litmus test of that, by the way, is you know, I say to people, you know, if you, if you could choose any time uh, between now and any time in previous history to be born and lived, when would you choose? Hmm. And if anybody says anything other than right now, I suggest you brush up on your history. <laughs> because yeah. there has never been a better time than right now. And that's also one of the reasons I'm extraordinarily optimistic about the future of investing uh, in companies that are, are building this dynamic, incredible world that, that we live in and that are going to be behind solving some of the problems that, that are facing us. Hmm. You bring up uh, actually some really good points. And interestingly, you know, you talked about volatility, and I think it was you, Mr. Sloth, you, you, you're the one who introduced me to the term, you know, volatility is the price of admission. Yes. <laughs> so you, you, in one of the phrases we, we've talked about in our, our podcast series is ignore the noise, the ability to ignore the noise. So we've, we've, we've come up sort of with our own slogans, our own catchphrases, our own uh, statements. You have a, a number of good ones for the sake of our listeners. Is there anyone, one or two that you might want to share that you, you think that would resonate with them and that it's uh, an easy entry point for them when it comes to um, their own journey with investment? Oh, you're, you're testing my memory. I'm not, I'm not good at, at pulling, pulling quotes uh, up. I, I will say one of my, my favorite quotes is from a friend of mine, actually, Christy Shen, uh, who wrote uh, Quit Like a Millionaire, uh, which is another book I, I recommend. But and I'm going to have to paraphrase this. I won't get exactly right. But Christy says something along the lines of, if you understand money, if you get money right, life's incredibly easy. If you don't understand money and you get it wrong, life's incredibly difficult. And I think that's really true. And then another quote, as I'm talking about it, that I like is from a guy, uh, the white coat investor, uh, a guy named Jim Dahl. And again, I'm going to have to paraphrase, but but uh, Dr. Dahl says uh, something along the lines of, of money's like oxygen. You know, if you have enough, you don't have to think about it. You know, if you, if you don't have enough oxygen, suddenly nothing else is important other than your next breath. Yeah. And by the same token, if you have enough money, then money's not all that important. If you don't have enough money, if you're living paycheck to paycheck, 
then money is going to prey on your mind in a very negative kind of way. That sort of reflects back to Christie's quote about if you don't get money right, life's a lot more difficult. You know, and for our younger listeners, maybe we can equate that to Wi-Fi. Money's like Wi-Fi. You don't have a good, strong Wi-Fi, then uh, life is pretty miserable. But when you have <laughs> Wi-Fi alone under control and it's all sorted, um, life is really, really good. That's another great analogy. I'm going to I'm going to steal that one and add it to my repertoire. <laughs> I like it. I like it. Jay, here's a bit of information for you. I haven't actually told you, but within the past week, I've actually been in contact with Christy Shen um, ah. and actually I'm due to invite Christy along um, around about February. So that's another upcoming podcast in 2024, around about February time, Jay. So Christy, who uh, JL oh, just referenced, is someone that we should be having on in around about February time next year. So, yeah, we can ask her a bit, a, a bit, you know, more about that quote. So I'm really <laughs> glad you mentioned it, yeah no absolutely not bad yeah what a coincidence that was great yeah really great yeah yeah, yeah well christy and her husband bryce are uh are friends of ours and i've known them for a long time now and you'll have a lot of fun chatting with them oh fantastic fantastic um and one of my favorite stories from pathfinders comes from a gentleman named tim who i believe is from belgium and within that section of the book he talks about um, the fact that he learned a custodian mindset from his parents. So for our audience, would you be able to kind of elaborate upon that? What exactly did Tim mean, Tim from Belgium, in terms of that custodian mindset? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I wrote a, uh, on the blog, there is a, uh, this what's called the stock series. And one of the later posts, I think it's number 35 in the stock series. So it's not, it, it I wrote it after the Simple Path to Wealth came out. So it's not part of the book, but uh, is a post called Investing for Seven Generations. And the idea of, of the seven generation thing is a Native American concept that basically suggests when you're making important decisions, you should think about the impact that decision is going to have going out seven generations. So it's really focused on long-term thinking. In the United States, at least, it's become kind of a way to think about caring for the environment, right? So if you're doing something that's going to impact the environment for better or worse, it pays to think about what that impact is going to be going out multiple generations. And when I first heard that concept, I, I love that idea. And I think there's a huge amount of validity in it. And I think it implies uh, in investing. So it's long-term thinking and I don't invest uh, just for my own life span. And that's typically when you look at more traditional investment advice, there's the assumption that you're looking at an individual's lifespan. And, and some people still do that. Uh, and that's okay if you want to do it, I suppose. But, but I don't think of it that way. I think of it as being the custodian of, of the assets that I put together rather than the owner. And that means that when I pass those assets down uh, to my daughter, for instance, one of the conversations I've had with her is, these don't belong to you. You're the custodian of them and you have two responsibilities. Well, you have a benefit and you have a responsibility. The benefit is you can, you can draw on them up to 4%, which is kind of a good guideline as to how much you can pull from a portfolio and expect the portfolio to last. So you can benefit from the money in that sense, but you're a custodian of this money for the next generation. And your responsibility is to explain to the next generation that they don't own it. They can benefit from it, but they too are only a custodian of it for the generation that, that comes after them. Now, Passing down generational wealth is notoriously difficult. It's one of the reasons, by the way, I don't worry about, you know, billion. a lot of people expend a lot of energy worrying about billionaires. And, you know, I don't worry about it because that wealth will almost inevitably get dissipated over the generations and sort of accumulated by other people. So just it's a non-issue for me. But this is thinking out that set of generations is, if you care about uh, the future of your family, this is probably as good as it's going to get in trying to to make sure that future generations benefit from what you put together. 
Mm-hmm. I love that. Love that that concept of um, a custodian mindset. Uh, JL and Jay knows this as well, but I've read many personal finance books, but I think you write the most convincingly about debt. Now, in particular, in terms of the simple path to wealth, you refer to that as the unacceptable burden, okay? The unacceptable burden. Um, JL, do you have any thoughts on kind of contemporary society and the fact that, you know, a worryingly significant amount of people seem to get themselves into dangerously high levels of debt? Uh, you know, why would that be in our kind of contemporary society? Yeah, so first of all, I, I think it's appalling. And, mm. you know, our contemporary society has is, is come to accept carrying debt as a normal thing. Mm. And it is, it's, in my world, it's not normal at all. It's, it's akin to being covered with blood-sucking leeches. And it's just as damaging to your financial health as being covered with blood-sucking leeches would be to your, your physical health. You need to take out your sharpest knife and start scraping the little blood suckers off because this is not normal. This is an emergency. This is, you are never going to be financially free. You're never going to be financially independent. You're never going to have FU money if, if you are continually paying off debt and paying interest. You're borrowing money to buy something is essentially like saying, oh, you know, this car or this refrigerator or whatever you know, costs X number of, of dollars. Oh, I don't want to pay that. I want to pay much more than that. I mean, it's, it's kind of insanity. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think the first thing that, that I would want people to recognize is that this is not normal. Mm -hmm. Uh, and the second thing is that going back to Christie's quote, that's part of not understanding money. If you think debt is normal, you're setting yourself up for a very difficult, a very, very difficult life. So if you're carrying debt, job number one is, is to, to pay it off. And it's an emergency. A Mr. Money Mustache refers to it as your hair is on fire, right? <laughs> so it's, it kind of goes back to our yeah. quote about, about uh, Wi-Fi and oxygen and, and yeah. what have you. So if you have debt, getting rid of it is well, almost nothing's more important. Mm, absolutely. It's not yeah. normal. Then no, don't well. accept the, the drumbeat in the culture that it is. And of course, it's, it's so easy to get into debt because it's so available. It's so prevalent. Um, but yeah, no, it should never be considered normal. If you were to, to give advice to somebody who's trying to get started now, like the, I, I'm one of those late bloomers where I, I realized um, in my late 30s about how I could take control over my own finances. Um, for our younger listeners and even for our older listeners who are looking to get started, where would you recommend they start? Like, do you have a favorite author? Obviously, your work speaks for itself. But um, is there somebody else you would also recommend? You know, where you were referencing a couple other people who helped you along the way. Where would you recommend someone get started? Yeah, well, first of all, and this sort of goes back to the factfulness book and how much better the world is. When, when I first started investing in 1975, yeah, I had no concept of financial independence. Uh, I, I didn't know about index funds. They happened to that happened to be the year they were created, but I didn't know that. Um, so I was wandering in the wilderness. There is so much wonderful information out there. Uh, you're nice to reference my books, and I think they're a, they're a good addition to the to what's out there. And I uh, suppose this is not modest, but I recommend those. But uh, the information is there. I mean, Christie's book, Quit Like, Quit like, Quit like a Millionaire, is, is certainly at the top of the list. Uh, the Psychology of Money by Morgan Household, I, I, a great book, and I read that, and I think if there was an ideal companion book to The Simple Path to Wealth, uh, that's probably it. Uh, you know, there, and this is, by the way, this is not entirely new stuff. There there was a book uh, was written, I think, in the 1920s called The Richest Man in Babylon. Very short, simple book. In fact, my only criticism of it is I think it's so short and simple told in, in, uh, in stories of parables that it's easy to read it quickly and not absorb how profound the lessons are. So, um, yeah, I think that's a that's a good those are good places to start. Mm, fantastic. And I like how we started the conversation 
um by referencing jack bogle I, i'm just I, I know you are jl but um jay is as well but just such a fan of um jack bogle and what i love about jack bogle as well is just the range of his writing perhaps one of his lesser known books is um like enough as well i just love enough and just uh yes. so many books yeah um, that J jack bogle wrote as well but uh yeah fantastic um yeah jack bogle is is uh, and of course jack has passed away now but yeah Again, he's the he was the one who created the first index fund. He created yeah. Vanguard. Uh, he's he 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 truly changed the game mm. to favor us small investors. He really made investing much less expensive, much more powerful, much more accessible to the average person like like us. And he's he's a fiscal saint. Mm. And is the way I think of him. And one, if you'll indulge me, one quick story. Um, mm. uh, a number of years ago, and I'm I'm trying to th think about this, probably 2016, something like that, uh, after The Simple Path to Wealth had been out for a while, maybe 2017, uh, I was in Ecuador, and my wife and I were in a little a seaside village, and we were leaving that morning we were packing up to leave uh to go to uh chautauqua that i chautauqua was our these events that i created and and the last one was last year actually but they ran for about a little better than a decade where we took small groups of people to cool places to talk about this stuff anyway we're getting ready to go to chautauqua and we're packing and, and about to leave the hotel room and and uh i thought well, well i've got wi-fi you know, let me just check for messages uh, before I go. And I had an email from Jack Bogle. Wow. Talking about the simple path to wealth and, you know, how <laughs> how he'd, uh, yeah, his thoughts on it. And it just, uh, you know, I'm not given to having heroes, but, but he's one of them. Yeah. And you know, my wife still laughs at me today. I was usually, I was like a, a child at Christmas morning, right? Yeah. You're starstruck. I was thrilled. Yeah. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. I mean, my my book is due out um the end of June next year in 2024. But um I actually come up with being a big soccer fan myself, um, a fictional five-a-side investing team. And Jack Bogle is it was the first person that I included in that team. He's the captain. And you know, in terms of maybe a bit of a cliche cliche to use this term, but in terms of the Mount Rushmore of investing icons, being Jack Bogle is uh yeah, he's there, isn't he? Absolutely, absolutely a titan in terms of uh what he's absolutely. done. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah somebody, uh, you know, uh, occasionally people have been very kind and in, uh, you know, putting me next to Jack Vogel. And I, I and that's a huge compliment. But I, my response to that is if I've lit a candle in the darkness, Jack Vogel is a hot white sun. Wow. And, yeah. uh, you know, I write about the things and talk about the things that he created, that he brought into the world. And therein lies the difference. Fantastic, fantastic. Yeah. Chaps, we're in the holiday season. We've only got a few weeks till, mm -hmm. uh, till Christmas, till Christmas Day. So uh, I'm curious to know, perhaps we'll kick off of our host, if you don't mind, Jay. JL, how, how do you intend to spend the holiday season? What's it look like in the Collins household? Well, we're we're in Florida. And <laughs> yeah. uh, we're in, in a condo in Florida. Uh, we have a Christmas tree over my shoulder here that I can see. And if you can see out the window, you'll see there's palm trees outside. Uh, and we're fortunate that uh, our, our daughter is spending December with us. She lives in Savannah, Georgia. So on our way to Florida, we stopped in Savannah and, and spent a couple of weeks uh, over the uh, U.S. holiday of Thanksgiving. And uh, then she came with us on down to Florida and she'll be here for the month and uh on christmas uh her partner will come down and so he'll be joining us for a couple of days and then the two of them will will go back to savannah together but that's our christmas and it couldn't be better from our point of view fantastic fantastic that and jay you're, you're going to be sticking around in hong kong jay is that correct Yes, I'm going to be sticking around here and our, our, our climate here in hong kong is very similar to what you have in florida so i <laughs> you know, when the sun comes out, it's, it's nice and warm, with 25 degrees Celsius, um, but the evenings are cool, which I actually really like. You don't want to go back to Toronto? <laughs> I, I do miss home. I, you, you, you bring that up, but I just, I was chatting yeah. with my mom yesterday, and 
my kids and I were both actually still very sad that we're not going home to uh, to see it. But uh, that's not on the cards for this year. We would love to be back in Toronto and see the snow and see my mom's house. She, she, she's very festive. She has the house all decked out with, with Christmas uh, attire. And it, it just feels magical. And it, we're sad to be missing that. Yeah, as we talked about, I think before we began recording, uh, you know, I, I like being in the warm weather, but I grew up in a cold climate. And so for me, Christmas is cold weather and ideally snow. Yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And it, it's nice to nice to have that for a short period of time and then to be able to park it and leave the slush and the, and the drizzle behind and come back to a, a nice sunny Hong Kong. And how about you, Mr. Sloth? What are you doing? Ah, oh, thank you. Yes, Um. well... Uh, Mrs. Sloth's family uh, live in Frankfurt, Germany. So um, in the early hours of Saturday morning, we'll be flying to Frankfurt. Um, I'm going to take just a little side trip for three or four days to London, see some friends. I just cannot go to Europe at Christmas time and not be in London. It's my home city. I just love the bars, the atmosphere, uh, the decorations. Um, and then I fly back to Frankfurt to be with Mrs. Sloth and my mini Sloths, the two kids and Mrs. Sloth's family. So, uh, yeah, looking forward to that. So a bit of a European Christmas and we're, we're back in Hong Kong the early few days of uh, January. So, yeah, looking forward to it. Are you part- I love the name of the podcast, the Sloth. Uh, Oh, yeah. fantastic. Thank you. And uh, that's the name of the book coming out in June. Yeah, The Sloth Investor. So, uh, yeah, it's uh, my investing spirit animal. And uh, yeah, it's, it's really hit a chord. It's resonated with so many investors around the world. So uh, no, I appreciate that. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I hope I uh, you'll send me a copy of your book when it comes out. Oh, absolutely. Well, that's for sure. Yeah. And maybe may the, the S in sloth stand for snow for everybody this year. Oh, <laughs> fingers crossed. I like that. Well, people, I like the people that. in Florida will be horrified if that comes true. <laughs> 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 uh, oh, I just thought of a coincidence, chaps. I thought of a coincidence in terms of um, the last time we had snow was in 1975 here in Hong Kong. And that, of course, was the year that the index fund was created. So a nice little 1975 theme for us there. There you go. There you go. There they you have go. Snow in, they've had snow in Hong Kong. 1975 i looked up recently yeah i did not know that yeah there you go there you go ah okay yeah absolutely oh well jo it's been an absolute pleasure and um anyone watching if these books are not on your bookshelf well uh, correct that now because these are fantastic books the simple path to wealth and more recently pathfinders i thoroughly recommend both books i really do jo thank you so much for your time and jay thanks again for joining me on episode 32 of the stop investor podcast Happy holidays, everybody. Happy holidays, and thank you for uh, having me. I've had a blast. Happy holidays, everyone. Bye for now. Bye now.